By the mid-1990s, Dragon Ball Z was pretty much already complete as a series, resolving its final arc in January 1996. This series completion realistically only marked the beginning for what would become of the franchise. After the series really began expanding to Western audiences in the late 90s, the name Dragon Ball Z would explode into a worldwide phenomenon capturing the hearts and souls of millions across the globe. With that kind of reach, it's pretty much a no-brainer to realize that there would be a market for video games based on the property. An anime about martial arts fighting and high-intensity energy beam combat? Yeah, you could say it was meant to be. There were precisely two Dragon Ball Z video games released on Sony's new-at-the-time flagship console, the PlayStation. Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22 and Dragon Ball Z Irenaru Dragon Ball Densetsu. A third Dragon Ball game was released on the PS1 as well under the GT moniker called Dragon Ball GT Final Bout, so I'll be covering that one as well just to make the video comprehensive. Today we'll be examining each game individually in the order they were released, talking about their history, development, gameplay, and reception. So thanks for joining me today as we look at every Dragon Ball Z game on the Sony PlayStation. Okay, what the hell am I sensing? Is that the Namekian? Is that me? Is that me stronger than me? I'll f***ing kill me! On July 28, 1995, Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22 was released for the Sony PlayStation. But only in Japan. This title was a Japanese exclusive for over a year. You gotta remember, in the mid-90s, Dragon Ball Z had not expanded to become the phenomenon that it is now. In fact, anime in general was still a very, very niche subculture outside of Japan. So the developers just assumed there wasn't a market for this outside of Japan. The game did eventually make its way into Europe a year later in 1996, but wouldn't see American shores until March 25th, 2003, eight years later. By that time, the Dragon Ball name had already started its momentous snowball towards worldwide fame, which did help it find some sales in the US, but the game was severely outdated by that point, being roughly seven years old and released on a console over three years past the end of its own lifespan with the Sony PlayStation. No new audio was recorded for the game's American re-release either, which adds a flair of novelty when playing the game as it features only the Japanese voice cast. Getting into the game itself, the title Ultimate Battle 22 was chosen to reference the game's impressive 22-character roster of playable characters. This is not including the additional hidden characters, though, as after progressing through all five blocks of the game's build-up mode, the player will have unlocked five additional characters to play with, and the title screen itself will even change to represent this as the logo changes from saying Ultimate Battle 22 to Ultimate Battle 27. While this is a neat hidden feature, the game almost wasn't called Ultimate Battle 22. In fact, it was initially revealed as Dragon Ball Z Super Butadin PlayStation version. The Super Butadin title was later dropped in favor of the Ultimate Battle 22 name we now know so as to distinguish it as its own game and separate it from the Butadin series. When first booting up the game, we're introduced to a beautifully animated opening cutscene. I believe this was put together specifically for this title, as I haven't been able to find any other origin of it. The animation is great, and looks like it was ripped straight out of the actual anime. Even better, there's a secondary hidden cutscene that plays when you unlock the hidden characters that displays all five of them in a unique animation that is also very cool. The quickest way to achieve this is with a cheat code that automatically makes all 27 characters available to you and plays the cutscene. Now, I have some pretty fond memories of this one, as it was the first Dragon Ball Z game I ever owned. Strangely enough, I owned it before I even had a PS1. Yeah, I had some friends at the time who owned this game, but didn't like it. And since they owned a PS2 and a copy of the original Budokai, they didn't even touch this. So I asked if I could have it, and they didn't care. So I had a copy of a game I couldn't even play, but I read the manual a bunch and poured over the cover art. Eventually I talked them into letting me borrow their old PS1 to try the game, since again, they didn't touch it due to having a PS2. I then proceeded to play this game to death. I don't recall whatever happened to that game actually, because all of this was going down when I was like 7 or 8 years old. Of the three games on this list, this is the one I have the most experience with. Now, there is no narrative or story whatsoever featured in this game. Unlike most DBZ games that allow the player to run through the events of the series, this one has no semblance of story or narrative progression. 
In place of that, we get something called Build Up Mode, which is very simple in concept, but fairly rewarding in practice. Essentially, you pick a character to play who starts at level 1, and then you have to fight your way through the game's roster of characters. Pretty much every character has a different level, and they're all varied in ways that, quite frankly, don't make sense to me. Like, Boo will be a lower level than Frieza, or Cell being weaker than Piccolo, stuff like that. The game doesn't offer you any way of seeing what's improving as you level up, but you can definitely feel the difference in fighting a character who's a lower level than you versus one who's a higher level. The only observable stat you can track is your health bar, which you can see gaining more HP with each level progression until roughly the third block. Now something to note is that your level only increases if you defeat a character who is a higher level than you. With that also comes the benefit that if you start the block by defeating one of the highest level characters available, then you automatically copy his level a tactic which I used to make these blocks way easier. Instead of fighting my way up by facing off against each character closest to my level, I would try to beat two or three close to my level to close the gap a little, then jump straight to one of the highest I could find and just cheese him. Now with some characters, this quite simply will not work, like Frieza, for instance. Even if you're like 10 levels higher than Frieza, he will still give you such a hard time because of this one move he just continuously spams. Goku also is consistently difficult even if you're a higher level than him. At the end of each block, you unlock a new character who acts as a sort of end level boss, and then each subsequent block after that will include a new boss until you overcome all five blocks and essentially beat the game. This is the authentic way to unlock these characters, but let me tell you, it's a grind, man. Kid Goku is the first boss you'll face at the end of block 1, and that is actually such a blessing because he'll always be a higher level than every other character in the block except the following four bosses after him, and he's one of the easiest characters to beat. So from block 2 onwards, if you just jump straight to beating him, you'll immediately skip right past all 22 default character levels and be able to just go through and slaughter them with ease. If you find him a little too grindy at the start of the block, just go grind a few lower level fights out for that extra strength and health, then try again. He's honestly such an easy fight. Although there are an impressive number of characters to fight with, you'll probably note there's no transformations available. Although a staple of the series, they did not make their way into this game. Instead, we've got each character in their furthest available transformation from that time, with the exception of Goku, who's in his Super Saiyan 2 form, but I'll get to that. So Vegeta, for example, is in his Majin Super Saiyan 2 form, Goten and both iterations of Trunks are in their Super Saiyan form, Gotenks is in his Super form as well, but does briefly turn Super Saiyan 3 for one of his special moves. Gohan is in his Super Saiyan 2 form, but Great Saiyan Man is not transformed. You get the idea. The exception to this rule is Goku, sort of. He can't transform, but one of the five unlockable characters is Super Saiyan 3 Goku. He's his own character with his own movesets, but he looks as sick as you'd think. Though out of all 27 characters, there is one that struck me as... odd. The final boss of build-up mode and the last unlockable character is the fusion between Goku and Vegeta, Vegito. In the series, Goku and Vegeta have to use a special item called the Patara Earrings, which combine the body and minds of whoever wears them. Now, if you're looking at the screen right now, you might be thinking, wait, Evan, that isn't Vegito, that's Gogeta. The difference is that Gogeta is the result of performing the fusion dance. Well, dear viewer, you're right, but you're also wrong. This is Vegito, at least according to the game. See? Now, you're probably thinking, that's not how Vegito's name is spelled, though. His name is canonically spelled with an I. Okay, so probably just a translation error then, right? After all, this was translated in the 90s, not to mention there is a translation that does spell it with an E instead. But that one uses two T's. Well, no, this is definitely supposed to be Vegito because he literally has the final Kamehameha attack, which is Vegito's move. The animation that plays when you unlock the hidden characters shows Goku and Vegeta merging through a beam of light next to their ears, but they don't seem to be wearing the earrings. They're not doing the fusion dance. Well, all of that doesn't matter. The final consensus I found was that this is Gogeta, but was called Vegito in the US release by mistake. All right, let's get into the gameplay. Since this is a fighting game, you would think that this is going to be the absolute bread and butter here. I mean, it would seem to be the most important factor, but the gameplay itself is honestly the weakest aspect on offer. After playing dozens and dozens of matches, I can tell you that the moves are hard to pull off, the input is weird, and doesn't always react as expected, but the worst of it is that the characters are just totally unbalanced. 
I see what they were hoping to achieve by having every character feature unique moves to them, but some of these are ridiculous. I'm thinking specifically about the charging move Frieza literally just spams, but there's others like Piccolo's arm thing, for example. I quickly realized that the move here was to quickly figure out if I'm facing an aggro character or a defense character. Most characters can be overcome by spamming your jump and kick moves repeatedly, but some are just too aggressive for that and you end up needing to fall back heavy on your block move. This is why it's so crucial to be an equal or higher level than your opponent if possible, because the lower your level, the less effective your block, and you're going to be slaughtered. I think easily the most egregious issue is that your matches will typically be over in 30 seconds or less. Maybe if you're going hard against someone who's a higher level and you're playing defense heavy, it'll stretch out to 60 seconds, but probably not. The good news is that this translates to you being able to blow through a block in roughly 25 minutes, because you'll spend about 30 seconds in menus and 30 seconds in a match for 22 to 27 individual matches depending on the block. So you could realistically beat this game in totality within 3 hours. Of course, that's just leveling up that one character. If you want to do that with all 27 characters, then it becomes significantly more daunting. The music in the game is pretty cool. I'd say it ranges from passable to good, except for one track which just goes unreasonably hard, that being Trunks' theme in the game. Yeah, almost every character gets their own theme to go with them specifically for when you fight them, and this one is just insanely good. Although again, I think most of them are very forgettable, and not every character gets one. I don't love the soundtrack, and without the Trunks theme standing out here, the whole thing would be mediocre at best, but it's okay. To the game's credit, you are given 11 individual stages to do battle on. They don't affect the gameplay in any meaningful way, but they are pretty cool to look at in the background. It's all the usual locations you would expect. Kami's Lookout, Hyperbolic Time Chamber, World Martial Arts Tournament. Then you've got more barren locations like Namek, the Plains, the Desert. You get the idea. When Ultimate Battle 22 initially released in Japan back in 1995, it was subject to average reviews. No one was exactly gushing over the game, but it did hold up well enough to the competition of the time, so it found its place just fine among the other fighting games of the mid-90s. As mentioned earlier, however, Ultimate Battle 22 didn't see release in the United States until 2003, roughly eight years after its initial release, by which point the PS1 was way past its lifespan, the PS2 had been out for nearly three years, and Dragon Ball Z Budokai had already released for the PS2 the year prior, which made the game's first exposure to American audiences incredibly sour. Reviewers at the time absolutely destroyed the game, with GameSpot giving it a 1.2 out of 10 and calling it a quote, really, really terrible game, end quote. X-Play on G4 called the game a waste of time and money, and the official US PlayStation Magazine gave it a 1 out of 5, literally the worst possible score. And IGN gave it a 4.0 out of 10. One last thing I'd like to mention here before I finish up with this one is that Ultimate Battle 22 features the last ever vocal performance from the original Japanese VA of Master Roshi, Kohi Mayauchi, as he died while the game was being finished. The game mentions his name in the end as a tribute. Rest in peace. The story of Ultimate Battle 22 is very odd, and the decision to even bother with securing a US release eight years after the fact may not have been a well-received one, but I personally am grateful it happened. Yes, Ultimate Battle 22 is a pretty bad game, but it's also the first Dragon Ball Z game I ever owned, and I've got a lot of memories with this quirky little misstep of a title. It fell short in a lot of ways, and it's filled with some very bizarre design choices and development decisions, but when all is said and done, all it was trying to do is be a way to throw some of your favorite characters on a screen and fight with them, like a kid playing with action figures. And to that effect, I think it succeeded in its goal at the very least. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that's from. Next up is a title with an equally strange story to go along with this development as with the previous game. You ever heard the saying, better late than never? Well, Dragon Ball Z The Legend, more commonly known as Dragon Ball Z Irenaru Dragon Ball Densetsu, never even saw a US release. The game launched first in Japan on March 31st, 1996, and then followed up with a European release coming out in December of that same year. But it never saw store shelves in the United States. Because of this fact, actually playing this game can be a little challenging. 
I played through the game's main story mode regardless, and, well, it's almost all in Japanese. I say almost because some parts of it are in English, but like, less than 5%. There really isn't nearly as much to say about this one, honestly. You can see just about everything the game has to offer in under 3 hours. Two and a half realistically if you figure out the mechanics pretty quick and can read Japanese. Now, not only had I never played this one before I did this video, I'd never even heard of it, which isn't surprising given the circumstances outlined above, but still this gave a hint of excitement going into it. A brand new DBZ game I've never played and on the PS1. I was a little hyped because DBZ was like my favorite thing growing up, and boy was I in for something. The game's main story mode takes place across eight levels, which the game calls episodes. Each episode depicts various of the most iconic battles from the series. In order, we've got the Sand Saga, where you face off against Nappa and then Vegeta, then the Ginyu Saga, the Frieza Saga, the Android Saga, the Cell Game Saga, the Majin Buu Saga, the Fusion Saga, and then lastly, the Kid Buu Saga. Most of these levels which feature multiple battles in one combat sequence like the Android Saga level where you fight against Androids 19 and 20 first and then right after have to fight 17 and 18, 16 too if you have Goku in your party. Its little manga cutscenes leave a lot to be desired in my opinion, though cool in concept, I find them lacking in execution. As far as major battles, it's all killer no filler, which means there are some cool skirmishes we'll be missing out on, like any battle with Cell before the final conflict at the Cell games. Most of the big Boo arc battles are there though, and we get to play as Vegito done correctly in appearance and name, so that's a plus. So yeah, they essentially just have you playing through the events of the manga, which is cool, and a nice addition coming from Ultimate Battle 22, which did not have any such mode. It's cool to see the events play out, but then again, it's always cool. A neat note is that before every episode, we're given a little recap to lead into our battle, which uses pages from the manga itself. You'll notice earlier I said you play through the events of the manga, not the anime. This is because unlike most other games, this one really is going for the manga instead of the anime. It doesn't make much of a difference as the two are incredibly similar anyway, but it is a unique little quirk to make the game stand out. If you've been watching this footage wondering what the hell is going on, then let me assure you, the gameplay is about as frantic as the screen implies. Playing this game is an absolute nightmare, man, and I spent the first few levels trying to figure out how to play it, looking things up and really giving it my best shot to learn the mechanics here. Unfortunately, even if you do, it doesn't matter because the mechanics themselves really suck. The best thing I can say here is that it's unique. This game is offering up a Dragon Ball Z experience unlike anything else I've ever seen, and the 3D environments with 2D sprites is indeed ambitious. The multiple people fighting on screen at once is also a really cool idea in concept. In execution, it's really hard to tell what's even going on. Everything you do seems to constantly deplete your key energy, and it's just so easy for the enemy to lock you into a combo and mess you up that the game stops being fun if you don't kind of cheese it out by abusing the block function. In a sort of Smash Brothers-like feature, the characters don't take damage from hits, but every hit landed gives you points into a meter that you and your NPC companions are fighting the enemy NPCs to fill, and once filled, that meter will determine who launches a finisher move, and that's the only way to damage your enemies. Each time your character does a finisher, the game stops outright, and you have to watch a 5-10 to 10 second cutscene of the animation. This will occur roughly 10 times per level, sometimes even more. I cannot explain to you how much this just destroys the combat flow and pacing. Stuff like this should be saved for turn-based RPGs, which honestly, this game would have been way better off trying to be instead of this weird fighting game. Because interrupting my combat for 5-10 to 10 seconds repeatedly throughout the match to deliver the only way you can actually hurt your opponent is legitimately almost game-breaking. You cannot skip this either. I found the best thing you can do is find which character offers the shortest finisher animation and just stick with them to make things flow at least a little smoother. There's no sugarcoating it though, this isn't fun. Like playing this may be a short endeavor, but it certainly isn't very sweet. Akira Toriyama was supposed to design an original character for this game which might have helped it stand out, but that fell through, as did an appearance from Gogeta. The music isn't anything worth mentioning either, there's no standout tracks here or anything. It's your standard fair midi music. If anything, I'd call it weak. It honestly sounds like the kind of music I'd hear on a Game Boy game. Not something I'd expect from a title on the Sony PlayStation. Shockingly, the game was met with generally favorable reviews upon release. It was praised for its large selection of characters and unique blend of strategy and fighting game elements similar to the Psychic Force games. The soundtrack was universally panned as lazy, however. All in all, I feel I can confidently say we here in the US didn't end up missing out on much when this never reached our shores. Now hit 
my music. Get into the grave. Oh, the f with this. Although not technically a Dragon Ball Z game, Dragon Ball GT Final Bout is definitely close enough to make this list, and even more worthy due to it actually being the very first Dragon Ball game ever to see release in North America. Yeah, oddly enough, the first Dragon Ball game us Americans were able to buy was a GT title. Which is good enough because it features a plentiful roster of characters from the much acclaimed Z anime. Adding to its list of firsts, Final Bout was also the first game in the Butadin series by Tosi Software to be rendered out entirely in 3D, although it would be the last Dragon Ball game released on the PlayStation. Looking at the original cover art, you can see they depict Goku in his GT blue clothes and utilize the Japanese logo for GT. Honestly, this cover art is rough. From a cover art design perspective, this is ugly and bland to look at. They really threw a PNG of Goku on a black background, dropped a blue glow, added an illegible logo, and called it a day. This is a really terrible first impression, but luckily they did end up correcting this issue with the 2002 and 2004 reissues, which featured a new and vastly improved artwork showing Goku in his Super Saiyan 4 form, which is the moneymaker obviously, and used the edgier Americanized GT logo instead. And we can actually read the final bout text this time around. Now, I remember playing this at a friend's house as a kid, but not much beyond playing it a few times and knowing Kid Goku was in it. So I was also really excited to get back into this one again after probably two decades and see what it's all about. Final Bout is in almost every sense a sequel to Ultimate Battle 22. It was made by the same developers, features the same game modes, and was also received very poorly. You've got your standard battles, your tournament mode for PvP, and the return of the build-up action where you can fight through the entire character roster repeatedly until you've beaten every character. There are some marked differences and improvements, however. For example, the main PvE mode takes you through... kind of a story? Well, I mean, there's a final boss if you beat every other character, where you get to face off against Ozaru Baby from GT. Which is pretty cool, in theory anyway. It's not exactly a GT game though, as it features more Z characters than it does GT, but it does include a handful of GT characters. We've got both kid and adult Goku variations in his blue GT clothing, Pan, Trunks in his normal and super variation with his GT clothes, and of course, Super Saiyan 4 Goku. Then we also get the baby boss fight if you play all the way through the default versus mode. Other than that, it's really more of a Z game as we get Gohan in his Z clothes, Vegeta in his Boo art clothes, Kid Boo spelled wrong, Cell, Frieza, and even Super Vegito. The character roster is smaller this time around, which they make up for by turning the originally 5-block build-up mode into a grueling 7-block build-up mode. There's a total of 17 available characters after everyone's been unlocked. This is not including Ozaru Baby, as he's not a playable character. It's the same as it was in Ultimate Battle 22 here, where you can pick a character and then play through the blocks to make them stronger and stronger, then face your strong characters off against each other in a battle mode. They've also added these little character select animations where the characters pop up and interact before you load into the match, which is really cool except that they didn't get the real voice actors from the Funimation dub, so this ends up sounding like you bought a Dragon Ball Z game off of Wish. You seem happy. I won't let you interfere. Probably the most frustrating part about the character selection for me is that as a Vegeta fan, we only have one single iteration to pick from his Super Saiyan 2 form, and it's not even from GT either. As mentioned earlier, it's his outfit from the Boo Sagas. What the hell, we get four different variations of Goku. Okay, you say, well, he is the main character, but then we get three different variations of Trunks. His standard and Super forms in GT clothes, and then his future Trunks iteration from the Android Saga. Why? I have no idea. You'd think they would at least throw us a bone with Vegeta's Super Saiyan 4 transformation, but no. No Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta, and no Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta either. Instead, we get Super Vegito, also from the Boo arc. Why? I sort of suspect this was being developed as a 3D Dragon Ball Z game that got turned into a GT game halfway through development. Can't prove it, but over half of the characters here are straight from Z. Let me know what you think in the comments, because my speculation, without any evidence, is that Tosi began working on this as a follow-up to Ultimate Battle 22, and the idea was for it to be a totally 3D DBZ game. 
During the game's development, however, GT was in the midst of its initial air, running from February 1996 to November 1997. So I'm figuring that since GT was the currently existing Dragon Ball property on air at the time, and since it was being developed as the continuation sequel series to Dragon Ball Z, sometime nearing the end of Final Bout's development, either the publisher or the developers themselves decided it'd be best to include some GT characters and brand it as a GT title instead of a Z game. If this is true, it makes me wonder what the original game might have been intended as. But since this was released in 1997, and GT only started airing in early 1996, then unless this was developed in a year, then the GT branding must have happened after the game had already been in development. All of that is again just speculation, but that's what I think happened. With everything I've talked about, you might think we've got the potential for a half-decent Dragon Ball game here. Well, you might be right, if it worked. The game's actual gameplay isn't just bad, it's broken. Like, it genuinely doesn't seem to even work most of the time. It's worse than either of the other two games I've covered. Like, I tried to play it as intended, and it's just outright broken. I ended up finding different ways to try and cheese the AI in order to progress through the fighting blocks, and obviously, you know, that's not very fun gameplay, is it? The melee attacks just don't really seem to work. But don't worry, it gets worse. What's one of the single coolest parts of a Dragon Ball game? The big energy finisher moves, right? Well, you can't use them in this one. I mean, you can. There is a functionality that lets you use the finisher moves, but the way it's programmed allows the AI to either deflect or counter your move, and it always picks the counter, and it always works. When I say always, I mean in the nearly four hours I played this game, not once, not a single time, did I win one of these finisher attempts. Really, the only way you stand a chance at landing one of these is in a PvP match with another human where you can hope for human error to let you land the attack. So realistically, you can't use them, and the combat outside of energy attacks is just a joke. Everything is unresponsive and slow. The game is just... it's not finished. If you spent the time and tried to learn the nuances of the controls, then I'm sure you could still get pretty good at it and work out what to do, but that's really the case with any game. For the average player going into this thing, it's a nightmare to control. At the very least, I applaud what they were trying to do here, and the 3D character models, while ugly, were a step in an impressive direction as far as the PS1 technology goes. They look close enough to their anime counterparts for the time period, for me, but I saw a lot of criticism towards the game for its character models, so I guess that part is kinda just up to the user to decide. I think they're fine, personally. The music is just as weak this time around as it was previously, featuring several reused themes from the previous game and introducing several even weaker new themes. That one cool Trunks theme from Ultimate Battle 22 is back in a different iteration for when you unlock future Trunks, but that's yet again as good as the soundtrack gets here. I can't believe they justified reusing themes, especially when the soundtracks they're reusing are so weak to begin with. We don't need to have masterpieces here, but something that sounds like fighting music would be nice. How can you justify releasing this with just a handful of new tracks mixed in with reused tracks like this, nearly none of which are good? Come to think of it, maybe this thing was just thrown together in a year. Upon release, Dragon Ball GT Final Bout was not received very well, pretty much for all of my previously stated reasons. While some reviewers tried to put a more positive spin on the game, most criticized its drawn-out, overly elaborate meteor moves, the barely functional special attacks, and the downright unresponsive controls. There's a myriad of reasons why people couldn't get into the game, but I'd be willing to bet the biggest one is that it just doesn't even work. Overall, it was a pretty frustrating game to play, but if I'd owned this back as a kid, I can guarantee you I would have poured dozens of hours into building my characters, so there's that. Well, that's it. All three Dragon Ball games for the Sony PlayStation. What you might have garnered from this is that they all suck, and you'd mostly be right. But I feel like I need to mention that back then, people here in the West really didn't even know what Dragon Ball was. It was by no stretch the mainstream phenomenon it was destined to become at this point, but the fanbase was growing and there was an appetite for Dragon Ball Z video games in the West. A call answered by these games, and with them, many memories were made for millions of people who finally had the chance to experience an interactive Dragon Ball title on their home console. They're not the best games, in fact, I would call all of them bad games for the most part, but I mean, come on, gaming was still finding its footing at this point in general, and there is a certain charm to what these titles were striving to achieve, even if they failed to achieve it. As always, thanks so much for watching everyone, going back and playing these games was such a treat as I grew up obsessed with the series. I don't think I'd recommend trying any of these out for yourself though, unless you've got some nostalgic value attached, but I still had a lot of fun with them. 
Do you have any memories with these games? Let me know in the comments what you thought of them. Also be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to keep up with my future videos. Again, thanks everyone for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, that's all I've got for you.